I'm Mari Stewart. I work as a project coordinator for Cooperate WC uh, on its farm specific program uh, currently called Carbon Harvest. It's a brand new program that we've only been working on since October of, of last year and it's still in its early stages but essentially uh, I believe we'll come to talk about Carbon Harvest a bit more uh, today but um, in brief it is an initiative to develop a sort of cooperatively funded um, re regenerative farming sort of sponsorship program based on kind of regional carbon offsets um, and ways in which ways of connecting community and different stakeholders in our area to help scale up regenerative farming or carbon farming in our area. Um, I am uh, an ecological landscaper and uh, educator. My previous career was in academia uh, until I wanted to do something more hands-on. So now I get to, to do that. And what I wanted to share with you, just the way Zev shared kind of these little vignettes of examples of how cooperative farming related projects have worked. I wanted to share a kind of more extended vignette related to something that's, that I'm really passionate about. Uh, because often when we think about uh, everybody is on board with local food um, because food is so, it's something we consume every day and it's more accessible to us. But another, um, you know, something that comes from the land that we are involved in, in every, every day is fiber in terms of our clothes and textiles. But it's something that we think of less because I think as you know, consumer society, we've become so estranged, so much more estranged from the process of transforming or even engaging in fiber and making clothing. Just three, four generations ago, you know, villages and families, they would be involved in making some of their own clothing, weaving the cloth, spinning the yarn, dyeing, um, and then, you know, knitting on winter evenings and, and whatnot. And we've become very quickly removed from all of that, and very few of us feel empowered to be involved in that. So I want to uh, bring this idea of fiber, not because we want to have a focus on fiber, today necessarily, but um, kind of just ignite our imaginations in terms of what's possible. Uh, and I will bring an example from um, a specific organization called Fibershed. Fibershed, with, with a capital F, is, a, is an organization, in, it's a nonprofit based in California. Fibershed, as, you know, with a lowercase f, is just kind of analogous to a watershed or a food shed. So in brief, it's the geographical area from which a community gets its textiles and clothing. And to us, that's almost like a not even a concept because our clothing comes from like what, China or Vietnam or whatever the tag in the back of our shirt says. So I wanna share some, um, an example of this organization that I've had a chance to collaborate with and I have been a big fan of for a few years. So Fibershed, the, the California nonprofit started uh, I think around 2011, 2012, when the founder, Rebecca Burgess, decided she would take a one-year-long local wardrobe vow, sort of like you can take a local food vow, and she would only wear fiber that was farmed, milled, woven, dyed, and sewn within 150-mile radius of her front, front, front doorstep in um, San Geronimo, California. And in, of course, in order to do that, she had to, she couldn't pull that off alone. She had to start connecting to people. Who here is growing like hemp or cotton? Who has sheep or goats or alpaca? Um, who knows how to weave cloth? What are the you know, fiber mills in the area? What are, who are the dyers? What are the dye plants? Who are the clothing designers? And so it became, started as this personal project. And in the course of that year, she of course started connecting all the dots of like, you know, where's the fiber mill? Where's the dye garden? Where are the sheep? Who are the you know, sheep farmers? And so by the end of the year, it had become a community-based project where they realized we could st start recreating a regional uh, fiber economy, something that most parts of the world have just lost because of cheap clothing import, mostly produced in low-income countries, often really ecologically responsible. So the textile industry after agriculture is the number one polluter of fresh waterways. And many of you have, may have seen documentaries of the horrendous effects of, of textile factories in Asia in particular. So how could we do this differently? And to realize it's not just a pipe dream, this can be done. So in the, in the seven or so years uh, since that project, Fibershed has grown into a nonprofit and a movement. 
and it actually now has affiliate programs in other parts of the world. And essentially, it is just a network. So it is, today we're talking about cooperatives. It doesn't, strictly speaking, have a cooperative economic structure. Um, it's a nonprofit, uh, but it is a network. And for example, on the Fibershed website, you can go to the Fibershed marketplace, and there all the um, you know the farmers, the artisans, the millers, and weavers who are members of, of Fibershed can sell their products. So it also supports the members in terms of getting their stuff to people. And they're producing beautiful stuff, including like a fashion gala where it's all like, you know, locally spun wool and just changing people's imagination of what's, what's possible uh, with the, this bigger idea of connecting the wearer to where their clothes come from. We all wear clothes, right? Presumably, <laughs> um, most of us. Um, so how can we do this in a way that, that actually regenerates regional economies, but also soils and ecosystems? So since then, uh, Fibershed has regenerated other affiliates. So you can go to their web website and find uh, affiliate organizations in different parts of the world. There are several in the southeast. And here um, uh, in Asheville, there's the local cloth organization, which is not, doesn't have Fibershed in the name, but it's very much, you know, the kind of, in terms of their philosophy, it's similar, creating a regional uh, fiber economy. So networks of farmers, designers, mills, makers, and shops. And the fiber shed wants to create a rege regenerative fiber economy, not only in terms of, you know, connecting those, creating a marketplace or connecting people to each other. They're also spearheading and really pioneering the regenerative farming research that's happening in California specifically. So they have been early adopters of doing these trials on farmers' land, specifically sheep farmers' land, actually measuring and quantifying how those soil building, farming, farm and land management practices um, can help to sequester carbon in the soil. So they helped to co-sponsor one of these early studies with marine carbon projects. And so with, with uh, fiber farmers, unless you're growing hemp, which is another project of theirs, um, much of the time, we're, we're looking at you know, animals on pasture, and they're looking at how can we create healthier pastures, which create then healthier animals, um, and this beautiful, lustrous wool. One of the practices they have used in particular, this is specific to California with that sort of uh, you know, long, dry periods. It's a different ecosystem, different soils also from here. But they found the, um, just spreading compost on, on pasture it's a really effective way to boost the carbon sequestration in the soil. I think there's a study, an, a half inch layer of compost on pasture once, a one-time application, um, increases forage production, in, increases the soil water holding capacity, and increases uh, soil carbon sequestration at least one ton per hectare for, the 30, for 30 years without reapplication. So that's huge. And I'll show a couple of other examples. So on, on pasture, silver pasture is another sort of um, big bang for the buck kind of practice. Uh, essentially the intentional planting of trees on pasture, which also the shade protects the animals from um, the sun and the heat. And it creates a lot of diversity that, you know, co-action of the animals' hooves and the soil microbiology and the tree roots and the manure and the grasses. So also really effective practice in terms of carbon sequestration. Again, key because of the climate question. I won't spend much time on that. We can talk more about silver pasture later. And lastly, and this can be combined with the other two practices, managed grazing, also come to, comes into play for pasture animals. So whatever you call it, different kinds of intensively managed grazing. Um, so where does this come into play? What the, one of the parts of the genius of Fibershed is realizing that what this means in terms of the products that are grown on land managed like this, that you can actually make the case for people who increasingly care about where their things come from, how it was produced, that we can go beyond ethical and fair trade and look at the ecological impacts of a product when it was created. So in this case, textiles or fiber or, or clothing. And that if you know, if your sweater comes from 
pastures where the sheep are grazed in this way and the land is managed in this way, you can actually, if you measure the impact, you can make the argument that this is carbon neutral clothing or even um, carbon negative clothing. So they've come up with a much nicer phrase than carbon negative to call it climate beneficial. And that's actually a certification that Fibershed has created. Um, and so now fa farmers in their network who get a carbon farm plan can be certified as, their wool can be certified as climate beneficial. And in fact, this wool, this uh, scarf is, uh, is knitted out of um, climate beneficial wool yarn. They've also did this big project of having this cloth woven so you can sew clothes out of climate beneficial wool. And some of the um, sort of forward thinking big clothing retailers like the North Face created uh, a climate beneficial line. I think there's like a, a hoodie and a hat and things like that, a beanie. So in this way, it connects with, with our, our everyday consumption. I won't spend a ton of time on this, but I had the opportunity to d design one of these early carbon farm plants for a small fiber farm that's in the fiber shed network. Actually, this, this yarn comes from this, uh, from this land. So that was a cool um, project in, in California. And again, uh, for this plant, I specifically integrated a lot of the silver pasture idea, a lot of um, you know, planting perennials, which then uh, on, on pasture itself, including also hedgerows. And so just getting more of those perennial roots in the soil, intentionally rotating the animals across through the paddocks and just getting a lot of carbon pumped into the soil. Um, so in 30 years, the oak, oak trees that got planted on these pastures, the canopy will look something like this. So that's the idea with silver pasture. You, you still, it's not a forest. You still get enough sunlight to support the grasses, but it's not excessive. So uh, in this way, I wanted to share an, just a glimpse of um, farming that can be both cooperative and regenerative in hopes that it'll sort of get our imaginations going. I think that's the last slide I have. Yeah. Um, Do you know of any hemp processing for fiber plants around this area? Um, so the closest, I forget which state it is. Is it, it's not Kansas, Kentucky, I think, or Tennessee. Fiber Shed has done a lot of research on hemp processing. I think it was in Kentucky. Um, and so I'm not a, personally aware of hemp processing mills here. Um, so you might inquire from the, I think it's called the Kentucky Fiber Project. Um, and they might know of colleagues in the area. So that, that's another opportunity where, you know, hemp can be grown regeneratively as well. And what about cotton? Is cotton, I mean, I, as far as I know, it seems. So what I've, yeah, what I've researched is people say, at least in this area, and maybe it's because the soils here have been so depleted, they, people say, tell me that it's really hard to grow cotton organically in North Carolina. In the very least, at least the yields are really low. And so, um, you know, even some, um, I think there's one t-shirt company that does like organic cotton, but they get theirs. They used to try to grow their own and now they get it from Texas. Yeah. Opportunity threads. Is there... And uh, the 11th and the 12th of March at the North Carolina Arboretum, just uh -huh. south of Asheville, there is a two day symposium on cotton. Oh, wow and particularly aimed at color yeah but they're going to be talking about farming natural fibers and awesome Thank and, you for uh, sharing. and weaving and so on okay yeah yeah so another reason yes yeah, so i want to put a word in for kudzu fiber in case anyone isn't aware of that and we have more more information at kudzuculture.net one of the things i'm involved in and have been for years is harvesting the beautiful lustrous golden fiber that's in kudzu vines which has a whole traditional cloth making practice in Asia. And in my opinion, it's m much more appropriate than hemp or cotton for our bioregion because there are already a million acres of kudzu. And it's a nitrogen fixing plant that improves the soil perennial that doesn't require tilling or planting or weeding. It's just harvesting it. And then you can make uh, fertilizer compost tea as a co-product of the fiber extraction process. Yeah, so all these plants that we've forgotten that we can make fiber out of, including nettle, 
stinging like yeah, flax, yeah, yeah. Bamboo. Right? Bamboo, yeah. That's all it is. Canaf. Canaf is wonderful for beneficial insects. It's got lots of extra floral nectaries. It does quite well here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Zev invited me to briefly talk more about the, the carbon harvest project. So as I mentioned, it, the initiative is in its early stages. Uh, and it grew out of, again, it's very related to the cooperate WNC's larger goals of creating resilience in, in this area um, and, and specifically creating climate resilience, but also supporting farmers in our region, many of whom really struggle economically. And with this um, kind of a buzz around the potential of agriculture specifically to, um, to sort of move the dial in terms of climate change and actually start to sequester much more than it has been doing so far, sequester some of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. So um, the so-called, the big world of you know, carbon marketplaces around the world, many of which have been very kind of focused on big corporations sort of buying out their guild and then continuing to emit as, as before, um, there, there's kind of an emergence or a, a space for curiosity around a new kinds of carbon, carbon marketplaces that would specifically go to support farmers in, in establishing or continuing more responsible land management practices and, and in incentivizing that for them financially. So it would look pretty different from just, um, you know, a carbon, um, carbon offset or carbon credit project Somewhere in Asia, you know, um, just planting a million acres of, of tree monocrops, which is how it's often, often done. So um, there are some emerging bigger marketplaces here in the U.S. that specifically direct carbon offset funding to farmers. However, they work on a pretty either national or global scale. The contributions remain pretty anonymous. And these are mostly annual commodity crop farmers in the Midwest, for example. Um, so, as part of Cooperate WNC, we have been working on um, on, an initiative, on an initiative to create something like this, but that it would be regional, with the idea that uh, individual organizations or businesses here in Western North Carolina could uh, make you know contributions to offset their carbon emissions, and maybe we'll frame it more broadly as kind of ecosystem services credits, looking at the total health of an ecosystem, not just focus on focus on carbon, uh, but these, fund, these contributions would go to a fund that then helps um, to sponsor um, more carbon sequestering projects, primarily different forms of ag agroforestry on local landowners and farmers' land. So that's the idea in a nutshell, with the hope that it would help to connect farmers and landowners on the one hand, local businesses and organizations, as well as individuals to create kind of this sense of you know, sort of common stewardship over the land we live on, create more of a connection between urban eaters and uh, farmers in our surrounding landscapes. Um, and so we are in the process of conducting a few kind of stakeholder events. Uh, we're going to have a public event February 27th, kind of a learning circle, uh, where we invite any of you to come. And that'll be specifically focused on getting people's feedback on the model as it is being developed so far. And then what would make this work for you? Um, you know, what kind of uh, organizational model and, and uh, would, would get most involved and, and so forth. So anything you want to add, Zeb? Um, the only thing that, to add uh, that comes to mind is just from the farmer's point of view, why I'm so excited about carbon harvest and, and that, um, having worked with lots of landowners and seen that people like, for instance, someone has a 10 acre pasture and we talk about permaculture ideas for it. And like, this would be great to convert this to a silva pasture, but it's going to cost thousands of dollars for, to buy the trees, to convert that to a silva pasture, the trees to plant in the pasture, and then to tend the trees for three to five years until they get big enough that deer won't kill them. And that's all labor and fencing materials and possibly irrigation costs, like all these expenses and energy inputs. And a lot of farmers are already hand to mouth and don't have the spare resources to do that. So what I'm excited about this is that we're trying, we're basically mobilizing a pool of money and knowledge and support to help farmers get through that establishment phase to, to transition to practices to make it possible in their own kind of lives and business plans. 
And so I, I anticipate that if we can get that flow going, it could really amplify the scale of successful agroforestry and carbon um, sequestering farming in our region and help farmers to have success with their own farming lives. Mm -hmm. There's a question here. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the, um, the like local fibers mm -hmm. and trying to make that more of a thing. Like how, because it seems like at least with local food, so lots of times just like the, the price for local food is always a lot more and mm -hmm. it's like kind of unreachable, unreachable by, you know, your standard, your, yeah normal income like how does that compare with like the local fibers as well like what kind of work has been done to like make that accessible to everyone yeah. so good question um there's there, there are parallels there for sure and again it's when when you realize how much work goes into the entire process of transforming a plant or the the wool of an animal into a garment uh, and how the our existing cheap fast fashion system is only possible because of the you know really poor working conditions uh, and low wages of you know garment factory workers in really poor countries um, that a five dollar t-shirt is it's just ridiculous that that even, even exists so Rebecca Burgess I've heard her say she spoke at an event and she talked about it, it, this requires kind of a change of mindset of, of start moving away from that fast fashion of like buy and throw away, you know, get a new wardrobe for each, each season because you can, why not? Um, you know, that costs money too. And invest and in, instead start thinking of what is durable, what is made with good, um, you know, with good skill and good things so it doesn't fall apart you know, next year or after a few washes and think of clothing as an investment. So she talked about the value of a $300 shirt, actually $300 shirt that you pay for because it, it's, a, it's a proper living wage for the people who are involved in making it with care and with artisan skills. But then it's become something that you wear for 30 years or you pass it on as a heritage heirloom item to your children. So it's just changing that mentality of, you know, people used to have one or two outfits right one for Sunday and one for working <laughs> not much more than that so it, it's all about changing the mindset but yeah that question of access and equitable participation remains a live question I think I want to make sure that Pat gets uh, well actually I want to make a comment yeah. <laughs> yes Burnsville had a sock factory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it went out of business really quickly because it was a family business, and the man who maintained it died of a heart attack. And, I mean, if we had the mutual aid movement going that we have now, I might have tried to make something happen to try and save it. Mm -hmm. Because the, the wife of the man who died was like, he was the only one who knew how to run it. And I was just thinking, Baron could figure mm -hmm. it out. You know? I know people could figure that part mm -hmm. out. You know? mm -hmm. But they were just totally in the process of liquidating it. It was gone, and we're losing all of our industrial capacity. We've lost almost all of it already. Um, but we should think in terms of, can we come together to save those things? But the thing that I could have immediately answered about the cost, I, I bought socks, right? And the socks I bought, a bunch of them were socks that were made for the North Carolina State Troopers. And I don't know how they stayed in business, because I bought like, enough that I thought was going to be a supply for like five years, given that wool socks, which is what I like to wear in the wintertime, tend to wear out after two years. Um, I still have a five-gallon bucket sealed, so moths or mice can't get to them. And I haven't touched it. My socks, five years later, like I think three pairs have developed small holes. A five gallon socks. bucket full of socks. I have a five gallon bucket full of socks. Yeah. <laughs> I, what I realized now is a lifetime yeah. supply of socks. I thought I was getting, you know, like five or eight years worth of socks. I realize now I have a lifetime supply of socks. They're durable. Because of how they're made. So it's, you know, costs have got something to do with that. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in before Patrick goes into, well, he's gonna tell us fully on that last comment that Patrick made about the sock factory and it going out of business because the guy had a heart attack, probably because he was up sewing socks all night long. Well, fixing but sock machines. Yeah, fixing sock machines. Really <laughs> but um, is, this is a, one of the benefits of the um, worker-owned cooperative business movement that isn't th uh, talked about as much is the, the longevity of businesses that are worker-owned co-ops as opposed to uh, privately owned businesses. 
when you have a small or mid-scale business, if you just have, say, what's often true, a single visionary or a couple or a family even owning a business, and then something happens to that person or couple or small family, that business often just folds, right? It's not a resilient business model. The knowledge and relationships and power structure is so top-heavy that it's, it just can get toppled. But with worker-owned businesses, you're setting things up much better for long-term knowledge transfer and transfer of power, power structures because the power is already shared. And so if you have some people's lives change or die or whatever, the whole thing is a lot more resilient. So especially as we're looking at long-term businesses, which all kinds of regenerative permaculture farming type stuff need to be along the long game, looking at the 50, 100, 150 year time span, worker-owned businesses are just inherently more appropriate for that kind of um, approach. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and actually, one more comment on what Mari was saying when she was saying that the network she was showing wasn't like cooperative. It's like we don't have to really say, oh, something isn't mutual aid if it's not in the cooperative model or if it's not like socialist or whatever. Right. None of those things matter. It's about community connection and community involvement and community trust and an ethic. I mean, to me, the perfect example is like the Amish communities um, where, you know, they don't have like a built in like you know rule to do it, but they just come together and they help each other. You know? And it's interesting to me that when you were talking about um, the stuff that the Ager family did, I there's another farm that's also there flying called Cloud Farm. Mm -hmm. It's also from in that family family's land and Annie is from that family. And um, Isaiah bought strawberries one time and he offered me to buy in on them and we both got like five thousand strawberries and I saw them every week at the market, but about two weeks later, he said, so you got them all in? I said, no, I'm nowhere near have them all in, right? I said, what about you? Oh, we got them in about two hours. I'm like, what? And said, anytime we got a project, people just come, you know? So that spirit is still there, yeah. you know? Because, you know, and that's, you know, that's a big part of what we have lost, and maybe one of the hardest things for us to rebuild is that spirit. I mean, there's good stuff happening in lots of places. CeeLo has a, an ongoing mob, Crop mop thing that happens every year, and they call it swarms now. And so that those kinds of ethics, we can rebuild them, and we want to work on rebuilding them. 